Good morning. I, I decided this morning I'd, I'd at least give you a familiar sweater vest. Uh, it's the closest to Eric I can manage this morning. Um, especially on this, as is, is I've joked, you know, being a youth pastor for 15 some odd years, this is annual someone who's not the pastor preach Sunday. Just in case you didn't know, that's the first Sunday after Christmas is annual someone who's not the pastor preach Sunday. I happen to win the drawing this year, so... <coughs> We're going to be talking a little bit because we're approaching the new year. Uh, And as you can see, my title is Small Things, Big Difference. And uh, as we think about the new year, there's always something, you know, we always hope we can change. The resolutions that we make, uh, and in fact, I've seen several things on the internet recently, you know, you talk about the gym on December 31st. There's two people and some crickets. On January 1st, there's 5,000 people. And we wonder why. It's because often we look at things... And we see what's going on, and we hope that we can change. But we look at people, and we see them, and we think, man, you know, Joel has everything together as a parent. I wish I could be a dad like him. Or, you know, Morgan, she's so fit. She has this. I don't know how she does it. You know, pick your, pick your thing. Whether it's, I see somebody who their finances are all together, and that's amazing. Or maybe you think their family is perfect. You know, we see all these things, but what we don't see... <laughs> what's happening in the background. It's always the small things that are making that big difference. And that's what we see in Zechariah. I'm going to read uh, from Zechariah. (coughs) Excuse me. Uh, Okay, Zechariah is coming up, right? Michael, maybe? Well, I'll, I'll give you some background. The temple was destroyed, and God's people were led away into captivity. And, uh, Zerubbabel, one of my favorite names. Wouldn't you love to be named Zerubbabel? It's a beautiful thing. But he led the remnant back from captivity to the land of Israel. And 18 years later, God spoke to him and gave him the power to rebuild. In fact, he didn't just empower him to rebuild. He commanded him to do it. And uh, the, the verse, we all know the familiar beginning. It's not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. And then God continues on. He says, Zerubbabel is going to rebuild the temple and it's going to happen. And then it goes on and the chapter closes with this little phrase. And it says, do not despise the small things for the Lord loves to see the work begun. And as we think about that, as we think about our lives, there are several truths. And the first one is it's often the small things that no one sees that results in the big things that everyone wants. You know, it's, it's that step to start moving more, to start working out. Maybe it's saving more. Maybe it's just spending an extra hour with your kids. But doing that small thing and starting there is what transitions into the big thing that happens. <coughs> One of my favorite coaches in college basketball is John Wooden. You know, he was at UCLA, legendary coach. He led his team to seven consecutive NCAA championships, and it would have been a lot more except for the fact that back then they didn't allow freshmen to play with the varsity. The one year they didn't win in a 10-year stretch, they placed second in their conference, and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar sat the bench because he was a freshman. Then they won the next seven. But every team he ever coached, he started with one Simple lesson. It's how to put on your socks. He would detail. He's like, you got to start with your base because you're making a lot of fast movements in basketball. So you're going to take that sock. You're going to pull it on. Next, you're going to pinch the toe. Make sure there's no wrinkles at the toe and it's nice and tight. Then he'd go on to how they should put on their shoes. You've got all these college freshmen who've come in who were great in high school. And yet he chose to start with put on your sock. Make sure it's tight. Pull on your shoe. Lace it up. Don't just pull it tight. Go every single row up so it's nice and snug so you can make the movements you need to. That's where every team that he coached started. It wasn't with how to shoot a layup. It wasn't with free throws. It wasn't with anything we would typically associate with basketball. He started with the socks and shoes because, as he said, it's the little things that are vital. Little things make big things happen. 
And that led to seven consecutive NCAA championships. And strangely enough, it's what God said to Zechariah. Don't despise the small things because he loves to see the work begun. Which leads me to the, the, the main point. Small adjustments make a big difference. And there are three areas we're going to talk about that we can make a little difference and a little change and change our 2015. The first is your thoughts. The second is your words. And the third is your habits. Because what you think becomes what you say. And what you say becomes what you do. And what you do becomes what you keep doing. It doesn't matter how we tend to coach it. That's the way it works. Because life always moves in that direction. As we think, so we speak. As we speak, so we do. And adjustment one comes from life always moving in the direction of our strongest thoughts. Proverbs 23, 7 says, For as he thinks in his heart, so he is. As he thinks in his heart, so he is. You think you can't? You probably won't. You think you can? You probably will. If you dwell on your problems, they're going to overwhelm you. If you look for opportunities, you're likely going to see some. If you feel like a victim, you will become one. But if you believe you can overcome, you most likely will. As you think, so you are, God says. So how do we change our thoughts to change us in small ways? There are two things. Capture your thoughts. And the second is captivate your mind. Capture your thoughts and captivate your mind. 2 Corinthians 10 says, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. I've told teenagers for years, particularly guys, that you can't stop a bird from flying over your head, but you can stop it from making a nest in your hair. Because as you think about it, you can't stop something from flitting through. I mean, currently our world is this sex-saturated adventure where you just driving down the highway, you're likely going to see two to three advertisements hawking something with some lovely lady in a bikini. That's the nature of the world. I don't care what it is, they're selling toothpaste with a lady in a bikini because that's what they do. You can't stop that thought from entering your mind, but what you can do is keep it from nesting there. The same goes with anything we do. You don't have to dwell on anything that flits across your mind. You don't have to be negative, but instead, Paul's advice is to capture our every thought and make it obedient to Christ. That means, yeah, it might have flitted across your mind. You're really angry at that guy in front of you in traffic who just cuts you off. But you have a choice. You can choose to dwell on it or you can choose to take that thought and say, you know what? <laughs> yes, I'm very upset with this gentleman, but you know what? I'm going to pray for him that he gets home safely or does whatever and that no one gets hurt while he drives. That real quick moment of capturing your thought changes your outlook, changes the way you think, which then changes what you say. Instead of, or some variation therein, or somebody you know, telling someone they're number one with a lot of emphasis, you can take that thought captive and change it to what Jesus would have had us do. So that's capturing your thoughts. The second part is in captivating. If we fix our eyes on Jesus Christ, because that's what Paul says, this one thing I do, I forget that which is behind, and I fix my eyes upon Jesus, the author and perfecter of my faith. So if you capture those thoughts, that's step one. Step two is to fix your eyes on what is good, what is true, what is just, what is holy. Because when we do that, and those are our thoughts, it changes us. And that's not a big thing. That's why we're talking about the small things. I'm not saying change your life in 10 simple steps. It doesn't work that way. You change your life 
One small step at a time. One small thing. If you capture and captivate your thoughts, it changes. Because, let let me read you some more from Paul here. He says, fix your thoughts on what is true, what is honorable, what is right, what is pure, what is lovely, what is admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. And notice the last verse. Then the God of peace will be with you. Notice, if you fix your eyes and you fix your thoughts on who Jesus Christ is and what he has for us, you see that? Then the God of peace will be with you. So if we start with our thoughts and we begin to change the way we think, it leads to the second adjustment. Because your words have the power of life and death. That's actually from Proverbs. It says that the tongue has the power of life and death in Proverbs 18.21. Your words have that power to someone. I mean, think about it for a minute. Have you ever really, really, really needed to hear something? Maybe it's that one word of affirmation. Maybe it's one word of correction that completely changes your course. And that's where we have the power of life and death. There are times that our souls are parched for one word of encouragement. That one, you know, you did a really good job last night. Or whatever it is. When you really, really need Those words. That's the power of life. The other half is the power of death, where we say the things we don't want to say, but we do anyway. And I'm sure we've all been there. That one phrase just tumbles out in the heat of an argument, and you're left picking up the wreckage. James has a lot to say about the tongue. And these verses from James 3, I think, illuminate the point. We can make a large horse go wherever we want by means of a small bit in its mouth. And a small rudder makes a huge ship turn wherever the pilot chooses to go, even though the winds are strong. In the same way, the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches, but a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. As we think about what we say, James is comparing it to a bit in the mouth of a horse so that you can go left, right, or stop. The rudder on a ship that even though the wind is pushing at 40 miles an hour, you can still steer. He says that is what our tongue is to us. And as we looked at before, our words are what we think. What we think is really shaping what we say. Whether we choose to acknowledge that or not, what we think is what we say. And our words can be life or death to someone. So that means the question is, what do we do? Proverbs 12 says that the words of the reckless pierce like swords, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. So you have a choice with your words, just as you do in your thoughts. You can skip it, or you can say it. I mean, it's, it's fairly simple. Most of us know you don't have to say everything you think. And that's especially true for those of us who believe in Jesus because we know the power of our words. I mean, think for a moment about Jesus Christ. In his earthly ministry, he gave the words people needed to hear. Whether it was a Samaritan woman who came to the well to get water, who was an outcast, a pariah. But because of a few words with Jesus Christ, she goes back to the village where she's not welcome and convinces everyone to come see this Messiah who spoke to her. Or you move on to a woman of ill repute who all of a sudden is coming into the home of a Pharisee who would condemn her and pouring oil and anointing the feet of Jesus. Why? Because he spoke words of life to her. And that leads us to Ephesians. Because as you think about words, <coughs> excuse me, this passage comes to mind. Ephesians 4.29. It says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up 
according to their needs that it may benefit those who listen. Did you catch that? He says, only let what is helpful for others, helpful for building others up, come out of our mouths. But not just according to what we think, according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. One of the toughest passages of Scripture, I think, for us to really practice is this one. Because as you think about it, we say things every day that are destructive, that are painful, that are damaging. And we might have good intentions behind saying some of them. But in that moment, we let those words spill out. And the ones that we say in anger pierce like swords, according to Proverbs. And I think we've all been there. You've had someone say something that pierced your heart and made you really want to curl up into a fetal ball and cry. Most of us don't. But that's the emotional impact words can have. So Paul says, watch the way you talk. Say only what helps. Make each word a gift. It's from the message. I love the way Peterson translates it. Let me say it again. He says, watch the way you talk. Say only what helps, making each word a gift. So as we think about our words, you can say it or you should skip it. You have to decide what is worth saying and what is not because our tongue controls the power of life and death for someone else, whoever hears us. And I don't know about you, but I have issues in that area. Because that moment you're angry, you say something. You didn't mean it, but you did. Because it's what you were thinking. And as you thought it, it turned into words, and it either brought healing or it brought pain. And that's what our words have the power of. And so what you see is that the good words we speak have to outweigh the bad. You know, they say for every single word of criticism, you have to hear seven positive things to make up for it. Think about what you say because you've thought it. And you had the choice to capture those thoughts and make them obedient to Christ and to captivate your mind on who Jesus is before you chose to skip what you shouldn't say and say what you can because your words are supposed to be a gift of life to the people who hear them. And I don't know about you, but I have issues always making my words life-giving rather than life-draining. So as we think about the adjustments we can make, the first is your thoughts. The second is your words. And the third is your habits. Because as you move and you continue onward, you have to make a choice. And discipline is choosing between what you want now and what you want most. In this phrase, I hear a lot of echoes of Dave Ramsey, who says, live like no one else right now, so that later you can live like no one else. And I can't do it like Dave Ramsey, because I'm not him. But that's the phrase, it's that discipline, choosing between now and what we really want. It's what I try to teach my kids, you know, hey, yeah, you've got money, and it's burning a hole in your pocket, but do you really want that you know, two, three dollar toy that you see on the aisle end because they stick it there so that hopefully your parents will buy that for you? Or do you want to save that money and get something you really want? It's a difficult concept for us to get because we mostly have control issues. We want what we want and we want it right now. I mean, that's, we, we live in the era of microwaved fast food served in, in a minute or less. I mean, that's, that's, that's what we live in. If you didn't know that, I'm sorry to break the news to you, <laughs> because it's a highly unfortunate thing. We miss out on some of the process that teaches us the discipline. It's like cooking a meal. Yeah, you can have that real quickly microwaved gourmet meal from the, the freezer section, or you can spend the time preparing food for hours and enjoying, you know, a, a Christmas feast. Most of us don't want to spend the hours preparing it, so instead we buy one that's pre-frozen, pre-cooked, and ready to go. You throw it in the oven, and bam, you're done. Convenience is part of that, and part of that is our desires 
We get confused between the now and between the then. Paul addresses this in a famous passage from Romans. He says, I don't really understand myself, for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. I want to do what's right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what's wrong, but I do it anyway. But if I do what I don't want to do, I'm not really the one doing wrong. It's sin living in me that does it. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Thank God the answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, we, we've heard that in various ways. If you've come to church at all, you've probably heard that passage. I do what I don't want to do. And what I don't want to do, I do. And Paul's left in this, the, the apostle Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament, is here in the conundrum of how do I discipline my life? How do I discipline myself? What was his answer? Jesus Christ is Lord. Because he couldn't do it for himself. And as we think about discipline, as we think about those small things, and Zechariah, he said, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. They're talking about rebuilding the temple, stacking stones on top of each other, adding mortar, creating something with their hands. But God told the Israelites, it's not about what you're capable of doing. It's about what I'm going to do in you. And for the Israelites, all it took was that small step of beginning the work, putting those first stones on top of each other. Why? Because God says not to despise the small things, for the Lord loves to see the work begun. And as they built this temple, a massive edifice of stone and wood, in honor to God, it wasn't their power that did it. It wasn't their power that allowed the work to happen. Because as I said, the Israelites were just coming back from captivity. They had no resources to speak of, and they really didn't have much of anything to give. Instead, it was God that provided the stone. It was God that provided the wood. And it was God that ensured that they could do what he'd called them to do. What did it take for the Israelites to get there? Taking that first step in God's power, provision, and authority provided the rest. So as we talk about the discipline that our habits form through and that drives our lives, we have to decide that we want to do it. And we have to discipline ourselves to get there. You have to decide what you want and have the discipline to get there. Most New Year's resolutions don't last. That's experience. The same thing as a youth guy. I've been to tons of camps, and I've seen altar calls. I've seen this. I've seen thousands of students pouring to the front. You've seen a Billy Graham crusade. It's the same thing. Tons of people move at the power of a speaker or at the desire that they're feeling in that moment. But how much of it sticks? In my experience, it's about one out of every 10 students who make a decision at camp carry that through the rest of the year. The other nine, yeah, they're good. And some of them last longer than others. They'll come back, they're gung-ho, they're reading their Bible, they're ready to go. Until school starts. Then school hits and they start the same habits that they had the year before. And that zeal falls off. It gets more difficult to continue. And their decision that they made back here, they don't have the discipline to keep over here. Paul addresses that in 1 Corinthians. He says that as we decide in discipline, he says, don't you realize that in a race, everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize? So run to win. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize. So I run with purpose in every step. I'm not just shadow boxing. I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. 
Paul's painting a metaphor for us. He says, our life is like running a race. You know, there are people who run aimlessly, and they tend to not get very far. Or as has been famously said about golf, it was a good walk ruined. But as you think about it, there's a purpose that guides our steps, or there should be. Because Paul says he disciplines his body to win because he understands the importance of what he's doing. That discipline that goes with his decision is what's going to carry the day, not the heat of the moment the decision makes. Because if we don't purpose in our hearts, it's that thoughts again, if we don't purpose in our hearts, we're not going to see any discipline in our training. Our habits won't carry us when the going gets tough. When our decision, we begin to question. When our resolve begins to waver, what is going to carry us through the day? Paul gave us the answer in Romans. When you do what you don't want to do, and when you don't do what you want to do, who's going to save us from the work of sin? Jesus Christ. Because our discipline goes about this far. But what really is going to change your life is the work that Jesus Christ did that was started at Christmas, ended at the cross, and is still at work in each of us today because he didn't just come to give us one moment of decision. He didn't just come to give us a little bit. He came to give us the power we need to do what he's called us to do and to be who he's called us to be. And as you look at those three small adjustments, changing your thoughts by capturing the things that you shouldn't be thinking about and by captivating your mind on Jesus Christ, as you change your thoughts, it begins to change your words and your words that have the power of life and death, you begin to have to skip less and say more to bring life to the people around you making your every word a gift. And as you do that, you begin to see your habits change. And as your habits change, you can run with purpose the race set before you, changing the lives of everyone around you. And that's what we're called to be. We are called to be exponential people. We're not simply about addition. We're about multiplication. Because if you think about it, we're the heirs of a movement that started with 11 men and a handful of women 2,000 years ago that has affected billions of people. That's exponential living. The disciples had to choose to be exponential, to not just live for themselves, but to live disciplined for the people around them. And as we approach this new year, my question for you is, What do you need to do now to have what you want most? What do you need to do now to have what you want most? Because as we think about that, the desires of our heart, what what is our deepest desire? And what do I have to do to get there? That's the question we're faced with. Because what we really, 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 really want and desire is what's going to shape everything we do. That desire shapes our thoughts. That desire shapes our words. And that desire shapes our habits and our actions. So I leave you with the question, what do you need to do now to have what you want most? What do you need to do? Maybe it's having one word. You know, that one word of affirmation that you need to say or that you need to hear. What is it? If you've looked at the notes on the back of your bulletin, I left some blanks, because I'm a youth guy, and I like leaving options. And under each of the areas, there's one word, one thought, one habit. What do you need to do? Is it having that thought that I can overcome this because the power of Christ is in me, and working to that goal? Is it changing your words to know that I'm good enough 
Jesus died for me so I can do this. Maybe it's changing that one habit that's holding you back from everything God's got for you. What one small thing is God calling you to do now so that you can have what you want most later? As we end the service this morning, I invite you to think about it, to, as Mary did, ponder it in your heart. Because as you think, so you will say. And as you say, so you'll do. And as you do, that's your destiny. So I encourage you to change your destiny this morning one small thing at a time because the Lord loves to see the work begun. And once it's begun, he steps in. He supplies our power and our weakness and his grace is sufficient no matter what we face. And that is what gives us the courage to make the changes that matter, to make a change in ourselves for the world. And it starts now. Let's pray.